Thank you, Stacy and Jennifer. Uh, our next speaker is going to talk about mindful awareness practices in cancer survivorship. This is Dr. David Victorson, who is an NCI-funded cancer control and prevention researcher. He's an associate professor of medical social sciences at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine and director of integrative oncology for the Lurie Cancer Center's Cancer Survivorship Institute. He's a licensed clinical psychologist, and he directs the Consciousness and Health Research Lab. His research focuses on mindfulness, yoga, resilience, emotion regulation, and cancer. Uh, digital health solutions to increase self-management, engagement, and social connection, and self-reported outcomes using qualitative and item response theory approaches. Thank you. Thank you. And is there a slide advance or this right here? Okay, great. So uh, I have no financial disclosures, but as Stacy said, I am the founder and director of a AYA support nonprofit called True North Treks, and mindfulness training is a core service that we provide. Um, so keep that in mind. It, it does my organization well if mindfulness is doing well. But we try to not uh, do anything bad there. Uh, I just have a lot of people to acknowledge on uh, some of the studies that I'm going to talk about today from lots of different uh, organizations around the country. And, and today I'd like to start by acknowledging just a little bit of the hype around mindfulness and what we can do about it as clinicians and researchers. Then we'll define and describe mindfulness briefly as well as some of its hypothesized mechanisms of action. Um, and then we'll highlight some of the ways that mindfulness practices go hand in hand with cancer survivorship and some of the different phases that, that survivors go through. And then make uh, an empirical case for mindfulness through highlighting some recent randomized controlled trials that we've done here at Northwestern with different cancer survivor populations. So I don't know about you all, but it's, I find that it's virtually impossible to go anywhere these days without seeing or hearing something about mindfulness in some way. Uh, and in the, the calm, blissful, peaceful, zen-like faces of every magazine cover that we encountered that have the words mindfulness on them. Um, when. <laughs> really a lot of people who begin the practice experience this. Um, but, you know, mindfulness has also <laughs> been appropriated commercially. Um, you know, they've caught on that that adjective can maybe add some dollars to their products. So, of course, you can get a mindful burger here in the area. You can paint your walls mindful gray. You can get a mindful beer uh, in Seattle. And did you know that pistachios are the mindful nut? <laughs> Uh, you can actually get a box of mindful food shipped to your house uh, and take your dog to the Mindful Doggy Daycare Center. These are all real. I didn't make any of these up. There was a mindful whiskey I recently saw as well. But it's enough to make you stop and scratch your head and wonder what, what's going on here. Um, rightfully so. Uh, and, and so uh, there's a really good article written by some uh, folks from the Mind and Life Institute called Mind the Hype. And it really just asks us to try and not overstate the myriad benefits that people are reporting about mindfulness to be conscious consumers and um, referrers of this process and also to not throw the baby out with the bathwater. That certainly there are good things that are happening with this, but, um, but to, not, to try and moderate um, the enthusiasm just a little bit. Uh, this was actually on my drive here this morning. I saw someone in Evanston, their bumper sticker said, non-judgment day is near. And if you practice mindfulness, you're familiar with the concept of non-judgment and how important that is. And I thought that was kind of awesome. Uh, so I took a picture of it and I asked if I could update my slides when I got here. <laughs> Sorry, Kate. Um, I thought actually um, in the spirit of have, having a lot of clinicians here in the audience, and, and even for those of you that are researchers, we might just see for a minute what it is we're talking about when we are talking about mindfulness. And so I'd like to invite anybody who's interested in engaging in a guided one minute mindful awareness practice with me right now. Um, thought maybe we can shake things up a little bit. So go ahead and just stay as you are. There's no need to get into any different position just unless you're uncomfortable. And if you'd like to lower your gaze, um, you're welcome to do so, but you don't have to do that either. I'm going to lower mine because it's just part of how I do this. And so for the next minute, and I'm going to try and actually make it a minute. Um, for the next minute, 
what we're going to do is simply open our awareness to allow in whatever it is, ha whatever it is happening right now. This might be sounds in the room, might be sensations on the skin, different temperatures, might be sensations within the body, um, the heartbeat, the stomach gurgling post-lunch, sense of calm or tired. There might be sensations of feeling fidgety or restless, or you might notice thoughts. Whatever it is, see if you can just be open to and notice them. Sometimes it's helpful just to continue to ask the question, what am I noticing right now? So I'll be quiet now for just a second and just see if you can allow whatever is there to notice it, not need to do anything with it. And uh, if it's stressing you out, just focus on your breath or something that isn't going to stress you out. Okay, and end. Uh, let's uh, open your eyes if you've closed them. And um, what I'd like you all to do right now is just to write down one or two things that you noticed or observed. And see if you can start your sentence with, I noticed or I observed X, Y, or Z. Um, and uh, we're not going to share. Don't worry, you can, it can be private. Um, and, you know, some of you might uh, be writing down different physical sensations. That's a pretty quick and common one to become aware of is the body. Um, how it's seated in the chair or different temperatures. Um, some of you may have become aware of lots of things coming up. Lots of different thoughts or images. Maybe there were some self-evaluating self questions like, what am I doing right now? What is this all about? Um, maybe some of you found yourself feeling calmer, more relaxed. There's a whole, you know, whole bunch of different things that you may have noticed or observed. But in mindfulness practice, when we teach uh, people to do this, we do what we just did, sometimes for 5, 10, 20, sometimes 30 minutes or more, depending on where they are. And then after we practice, we do uh, something that's called inquiry, which is in, in, in observation or in noticing of what we experienced. And we go around and people share one or two things. We try to help them be very uh, mindful to, to notice and observe and to not recreate the story. So instead of, oh my God, I was thinking about all these things and we might say, have them begin with, I noticed that, et, et, that, that. And, and that right there is the beginning of the self-regulation training. Um, helping people to become observers and noticers of their experiences, internal and external, and begin to learn to, to work with them. So the definition uh, of mindfulness or, uh, that comes from John Kabat-Zinn at UMass and others is the awareness that emerges through purposefully paying attention to the present moment, uh, to things just as they are, with qualities of openness, curiosity, and non-judgment. And um, most of you know it comes from the practice of Buddhism, which is over 2,500 years old from northern India. Came from Prince Siddhartha, who left his princedom to go out into the world and relinquished all material possessions and um, lived among the poor of India and found himself under a Bodhi tree. He stayed there until he could find enlightenment. And essentially, he came away the awakened one or the enlightened one, or um, the mind, and, and uh, excuse me, the Buddha means the awakened one. So in mindfulness training, we help teach uh, ourselves and others how to wake up on a moment to moment basis to what is happening in our present moments. And a lot of people think that it's just that. 
Um, but the more we practice and get into this, we realize that it's not just about waking up that matters, but how we wake up that matters. And so uh, my dad was a military man and would sometimes come into my bedroom in the morning whistling and, and turn the light on. And he wasn't angry like this, but this was the only military picture I could find of somebody yelling. <laughs> but as a young child, it felt like this sometimes. And it worked. It would wake me up. I'd jump out of bed, and it was never fun or pleasant. Now, there were those mornings when my mom, my mom would come in, and um, she would slide onto my bed and start rubbing my back, and all of a sudden I'd be awake, and it was a lovely way to wake up. I still woke up, too. Um, and so mindfulness training is helping to learn to not do the top, but rather the bottom with ourselves on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. The word mindfulness in English is a bit uh, misleading because it focuses all on the mind, but this Chinese character shows that it actually can be both present moment and mind or heart. And so a lot of times um, in training we talk about this compassionate awareness or heartfulness that we're also teaching. Um, I see some smiles. Now I've vetted this, practice, this character with many, um, to many audiences, but come tell me afterwards if this is not accurate or the right thing. Um, so the, the bottom line is mindfulness isn't what we think. Um, and as we begin to practice, lots of pieces of the puzzle begin coming together about what, un, what, what undergirds this practice. It's not just about what we think. It's not the attention. But it's all of these qualities, such as self-compassion, non-judgment, letting go, um, trust, patience, equanimity. And so when we think about what what it is that's powerful about this practice, why we see the needle move. It's that attentional awareness that starts it, but it's these things underneath that support it and, and uh, make the change. What I like as a health behavior researcher is it doesn't require any heavy equipment, um, no special machinery. It's available to us at any given time. We don't have to be a monk sitting on the top of a mountain to practice it, um, and it can help us be with the moments of our lives, whether they're activities of daily living, uh, in conversation with other people, being with family members, um, or even during and after cancer treatment and into, into survivorship. Of course, there will always be pains in life. And um, one of the things that we teach people in our mindfulness training is to not shoot the arrow twice that the first arrow is the pain that is inevitable and it's going to happen. And we help people become aware that when we quite often um, put a second arrow into that with suffering. And uh, the, the Vietnamese monk Thich Nhat Hanh said that when you learn how to suffer, you can suffer much less. And so this is part of the training. And so if we think about having the first arrow of back pain, um, the physiologic pain, but then the second arrow that can come to it with I won't be able to play with my kids, I'm disabled, this is horrible, my body's betraying me, is this my cancer coming back, what's wrong with me? We can help people become aware of this second arrow, and then at that point they have a choice about whether they want to stay with that or realize it and, and go someplace else. And so really briefly, waking up in this way can help us to slow down and create some distance between the actor and the event. John Kabat-Zinn said it helps us learn how to respond to stress instead of react to it. And I think that's a really simple definition of emotion regulation. Um, you're all probably familiar with the Hawthorne effect, that the simple act of being observed forces us to change our behaviors. And when we practice mindfulness, we self-observe. And so you're constantly, dynamically changing in some subtle ways. Um, it downregulates the SNS activity and upregulates upreg parasympathetic activity. So that can lead to the relaxation response sometimes. It's not a guarantee, and we usually begin by not promising that this is a relaxation therapy or that you're going to feel calm and blissful because you can be mindfully upset. Um, but for most people, when we sit and slow down and lower our gaze, it can begin to engage that system. So um, when we're experiencing a pleasant event, like drinking a cup of coffee in the morning for me, it can lead to feelings of gratitude or savoring. If we're engaged in a neutral event, um, it can strengthen curiosity and openness. And when we're having unpleasant events, mindfulness can offer us a different relay to relate to them. And we try to help people learn to see if we can turn this enemy into one of our best teachers, kind of a growth mindset uh, philosophy. So the annoyances of life will continue to happen, as will the tragedies. 
Um, but with mindfulness, it can offer us a choice of how to respond so that we can have a different relationship with what it was that was causing us suffering. So right now I'm going to pivot and start talking about some of the benefits of, of mindfulness or single tasking um, and how cancer and mindfulness are really well suited together. So at diagnosis, we all know that there can be tremendous fear, uncertainty, anxiety about the future, loss of routine, loss of identity. And mindfulness practice helps us to increase the tolerance to sitting with this uncertainty, like what, what, um, what Dr. Yanez was talking about earlier with her study, helping women with, um, with difficult side effects of endocrine therapy learn to sit with and tolerate those. Um, there can be significant impact from cancer physically, um, uh, in terms of treatment-related side effects and fatigue. And mindfulness practice, um, if there's one thing it does, is it helps us become intimately connected with our bodies, um, with, with our physical selves, with a sense of compassion. Um, most find one of the hardest times to be at that point of transition from direct care to survivorship. Um, and a lot of people experience significant depression, anxiety, and overwhelm at this crossroads. And mindfulness practices, um, you know, once you begin the practice, they really help us learn to um, begin to accept, acknowledge, let go, and let be some of these things so we can work with whatever phase that we're in. And then a lot of people with cancer report experiencing some kind of growth or benefit from it. You hear in clinic um, every now and then somebody saying, well, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. Uh, but getting cancer and going through what I have has helped me reevaluate things. It's helped me reprioritize what's important to me. And um, early on when I was, a, I'm a student of mindfulness still, but when I was just starting it out and I was reading about post-traumatic growth, I was like, wow, mindfulness training theoretically, conceptually does a lot of the same things as these natural experiences of post-traumatic growth. And so mindfulness also causes this paradigm shift and can lead to greater feelings of appreciation and, um, uh, and growth. So mindfulness-based stress reduction, or MBSR, was created by John Kabat-Zinn back in 1979 at UMass, and it has become one of the most studied interventions of mindfulness. Um, there's also some um, spin-offs, mindfulness-based cancer recovery um, from Linda Carlson in Canada, and mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Um, and so, most of the research available either is of these interventions or some kind of modification of them. And um, just really quickly in, in a review of some recent systematic reviews and meta-analyses, uh, all the usual suspects are showing a significant decline between treatment and, and control groups on things like anxiety, depression, fatigue, pain, uh, inflammatory cytokines, as well as things like cortisol and HPA access reactivity only changes in depression and anxiety appear to persist beyond a six-month period, um, which is not different from really any other psychosocial <coughs> behavioral intervention where booster sessions, maintenance kinds of treatments are needed to keep these gains going. Um, and the jury is still out in terms of the clinical significance of these changes. Just another example, I was um, looking online for a recent reviews, and this is a Cochrane review of uh, MBSR for women diagnosed with breast cancer. It was uh, 14 RCTs that met the inclusion criteria, over 1,500 patients. Um, all the studies were at high risk of, of performance bias because they couldn't blind people from knowing what they were getting. Um, and um, most of the trials included women who had completed their cancer treatment. And their major findings were mod modest as they should be, that quality of life um, may slightly improve at the end of the intervention, but may result in no difference later on. Um, it probably slightly reduces anxiety, depression, slightly improves quality of sleep, um, and um, a beneficial effect on fatigue was apparent at the end of the intervention and six months later. And the uh, MBSR probably um, has uh, little or no difference on things like anxiety and depression up to two years out. So I liked this review because it, 
it was at a level of modesty that I think we need to start keeping in the language of the benefits and effects of things like mindfulness, just like we would with fruits and vegetable interventions or with exercise interventions. So in our lab, we've got a few nagging research questions. One of them is, MBSR mindfulness has been applied mostly with middle-aged women with breast cancer. What about men? How about older men? What about young adults? Um, what other kinds of outcomes beyond anxiety and depression are important to consider? What's the optimal um, delivery approach for maximum uptake in, uh, in adoption? Is there a minimally effective dose? Um, how often or regularly do you need to practice to have a benefit? And what's the role of social interaction and support in all of this? I'm not gonna answer all these questions. These are kind of career questions, but we will go into a couple of these things. Um, just at the get-go, in case you're curious, all of our interventions that involve a, a group-based um, approach um, have a high degree of quality and fidelity. We use experienced trainers, uh, or excuse me, uh, instructors in the interventions. We audio or video record sessions. Um, we hold weekly intervention quality debriefing sessions. Um, we use intent to treat analyses when we're doing our analyses. And we also control for, for things like a person's expectations about what they think mindfulness is going to do for them. Um, we control for the number of sessions attended, uh, et cetera. So the first uh, RCT that we did was back in 2009. And this was uh, funded by an American Cancer Society internal research grant um, to see if we offered MBSR to men diagnosed with prostate cancer on active surveillance and their partners and their spouses, would they come and would they experience, would they report any benefit from it? So this was a small pilot study. And the design was after assessment and randomization, you know, a half the sample got eight weeks of MBSR followed by assessments through 12 months time. And the other half got the book that MBSR was created on, which is called Full Catastrophe Living. And um, the assessments were all the usual suspects, depression, anxiety, um, quality of life. We also looked at things like post-traumatic growth because of that connection. And while we did see more within group differences and you know, changes in the right direction on things like depression and anxiety, the only between group difference that we saw between treatment and control was in post-traumatic growth. And that effect was sustained throughout a, a full 12 months with a strong effect at that. And so that was really interesting for us. We put the measure in as an exploratory measure and it ended up being one that was the, 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 really the only between group difference in our trial. Within the measure of post-traumatic growth, there are two subscales that were really leading this difference. One had to do with relating to others. If you look at the items, it's about feeling compassion and closeness um, with others. And then the other one had to do with personal strength, which is, if you look at the items, they're kind of resilience-like items. Um, outside of the coolness of increasing in post-traumatic growth, we're like, why does this matter? And there's actually a growing literature showing a relationship between post-traumatic growth and healthier endocrine function, um, and, and also improvements in health behaviors, such as abstaining from alcohol or substances, um, you know, being more physically active and adhering to treatment or exercise guidelines. So that pilot study led to an NIH R01, which we're currently in year five of, which is a multi-site study, looking at this same intervention with men on active surveillance and their partners at um, uh, these different sites that you can see on top. Um, and instead of giving the control group a book, we actually are uh, entering the control group into a time attention matched health promotion control group, which we fully expect to be beneficial in lots of different ways. And we're hypothesizing though that it is differently beneficial for the mindfulness group in reducing fear of cancer progression and uncertainty. So another study I want to tell you about is one that we finished not too long ago called Redefine AYAO, and it was with young adult cancer survivors here. And um, as you heard from Stacy and Jen, a group that is a, a health disparity group in their own right because of their age, because of their in-betweenness of pediatric and adult oncology, 
and um, a lot of the social isolation and invisibility that they experience because of that. With the Redefine study, it was a waitlist control design where one group got mindfulness-based stress reduction right away, and the other group got put on a waitlist. After MBSR, we also sent them weekly um, texts or email messages that just had a mindful message uh, or uh, that, that was included, or they didn't. So we had a second randomization afterwards for another eight-week period. Um, it was kind of a light touch to see if we could keep them engaged at all. Um, but it, the, the main intervention was at uh, this eight-week um, group. We also collected you know, surveys as well as um, blood using a finger prick to look at biomarkers of inflammation and saliva. And um, one, of our, one of the first things that um, I wanted to show you was that between baseline and uh, 16 weeks, we did see a significant decrease in C-reactive protein among the mindfulness group compared to the wait list. The, uh, we also looked at interleukin-6, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine that also uh, is related to inflammation, and that didn't show any decrease. And there's, um, there's a lot going on during the cancer uh, experience, and IL-6 typically is implicated because of immune dysregulation. Um, but we were, we were, um, we thought this was promising that we could actually see a difference in, in inflammation through CRP. Um, in, in as well, similar to the other study, we saw within group change or decreases in depression and anxiety, but not between group. The only between group change we did see was in uh, a scale called self-kindness, which is of the self-compassion um, uh, self-compassion scale. And we saw over the 16-week period a significant difference between the, the wait list and the, the treatment group. And so, you know, you can, have a, you can have a peek here at what the items were for this scale, feeling loving and kindness toward yourself, especially when you're experiencing suffering. And this wasn't surprising because this is a huge part of mindfulness training, is teaching people to be kind to themselves when their thoughts go somewhere else. That's the most basic part of this practice is when we sit in practice and we're told to focus on our breath and we find out five minutes later that we're now thinking about what we're doing, where we're going on vacation in 2020. When we realize that, to be kind to ourselves and bring ourselves back to the breath versus saying, oh my God, why do I even do this? Why do I bother? I suck at this. I'm not a good meditator. So mindfulness training helps turn the volume down on that, and so that we weren't surprised that, that we saw this change. So again, why should self-compassion matter? And we, we know that it, it actually is really, it, it's uh, closely related to the development of positive affect, as well as the adoption of positive health behaviors, like eating healthy, being more physically active. If, if you think about it, you're being kind to yourself. You're going to be engaging in some of these self-kind behaviors. Um, we also saw that uh, in this study, mindfulness mediated the relationship between negative mind-body experiences, so things like anxiety, sleep disturbance, self-judgment, things that were going to predict not being physically active, that mindfulness actually mediated that and then led to those becoming smaller and insignificant. So um, again, there's a thread of can mindfulness not only help us reduce things like depression, anxiety, regulate our mood, can it lead to and can qualities of mindfulness help us become um, engaged in positive health behaviors? And so there is a small but growing literature on, something, on things like mindfulness and moderate to vigorous physical activity. Um, and that uh, basically the studies that have been done are showing that it can help people in become, uh, have be more intentional about their programs, be more adherent to them. and. Uh, hypothesized mechanisms are it, may, it might help people regulate the negative thoughts and feelings that we might have while exercising, and it might enhance some of the positive feelings that we have. And so, Siobhan, I don't know if she's still here or not, but she and I, she's in the back, um, I gave you credit to this beautiful figure. We're putting in a resubmission for a U01 proposal to the NCI to do a MOST trial uh, to look at different components of pairing mindfulness and um, her fit to thrive app to see if that pairing can help um, help people increase their physical activity promotion through through bringing those things together and last but not least uh, our our experience in trying to teach groups mindfulness 
um, has been positive, but it's also been incredibly challenging to get people to come to a in-person face-to-face intervention, especially when they're in the midst of their cancer experience or just a busy life, traffic in Chicago. Um, it's, it's enough to make you want to do something else sometimes. And when my research coordinator continually says, David, this person can't make it this week, what, do you, what should we do with their data? Have they been coming for three sessions? Should we? There's just so much going on that um, it's made us want to look to alternative ways to deliver mindfulness. And we have experimented with video conferencing mindfulness in advanced prostate cancer. Um, we just finished a study where we were giving men getting daily radiation treatment, um, audio of mindfulness while they were in the chamber getting their radiation therapy. So we're, we're trying out different things, but we really liked mindfulness-based stress reduction. It's progressive, multi-class format, the content that it offers is rich and it seems good enough to give you a, a minimal dose so that it can be of some benefit. So uh, we looked at all the different apps that were out there and I'll, I think I, show, I share a little bit of that here. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, recent review in 2015, I'm sure it's much higher now, but there were over 700 mindfulness apps in uh, Apple and Google Play. Um, 23 of them actually provided mindfulness training. And of those, only five provided a multi-week progressive mindfulness training. Um, as somebody who's been studying mindfulness as a student who teaches it, I'm all for getting a guided audio file to support your practice, but I don't think it's a great place to learn. Uh, it's, I think it really is beneficial when you can go through some kind of a formal class guided by an instructor, whether that's virtual or, or a human being. And, um, none of the apps that were out there were based after MBSR. None of them provided this quality of this element of inquiry, what we did where you wrote down something on your paper. What, um, what I feel is a very important part of learning mindfulness is the reflective piece afterwards. And none of them had the ability for an administrator or a researcher to go into the back end and to turn on or off content or tailor it in any way to their specific studies uh, demands. So we created um, through funding from the Osher Center here at Northwestern and through the Bloom Cardiovascular Institute, we created a new app called Wakeful. And this is a pretty common process of app development um, where you go from idea generation all the way through a pilot study, which I can safely say we are at that pilot study phase now, but it's been like a two and a half to three year process. Um, we deconstructed every single word and line and, and element of MBSR and we created napkin drawings and turned them into wireframes and worked with our, our app um, developer to basically um, create content that was brief but engaging and informative. Um, there are lots of brief um, videos that teach concepts as well as audios. And then, like most apps, there's a practice tracker. It um, it's, you know, engages people. It sends you reminders if you want it to. Um, and um, if I have a second, I was just going to play, if I can do it, I don't know. Hmm. How do I do that? <laughs> Is there a mouse? Yeah, it's a little Oh. Yeah. I right there. Cool. So just to give you a flavor of some of the audio content, or video content. Have you ever gotten in your car and driven from one place to another, only to realize you had no idea how you got there? Or perhaps you were in a conversation with someone, nodding your head and smiling like you were listening. But in reality, your thoughts were a thousand miles away. This is called autopilot. And while it's a normal function of our brains to give us a break every now and then, when zoning out becomes the default way in which we experience the world, it can lead to a whole host of negative consequences at work or school, in relationships, and even in our inner lives. But what if we could train our minds to move off of autopilot? What if there was a way of staying present, awake, and engaged to our lives, rather than constantly wandering off into the future or the past? Well, the good news is there is a way. It's called mindfulness. Mindfulness is intentionally directing our full awareness to whatever is happening in our present moment and just watching it, not applying any filters, lenses, judgments, or corrections. It is experiencing and acknowledging whatever is. Training our attention in this way takes time, 
but continuing on with regular practice, it is possible to turn off autopilot and experience the seasons of life while they're actually happening. So that little two minute video took a long time to make and we made 20 of those. Um, it's like making a little movie for each one. Uh, so anyway, uh, right now we're pilot testing it in, in cardiac rehab here at Northwestern, but there are some efforts to bring it to cancer. So with Bonnie Esner at Children's, we have a, a resubmitted grant in to look at stem cell transplant um, adolescence and using it in that um, environment. And also with Patty Moreno um, to implement it with her metastatic breast cancer study. She's got a pilot study from the ACS looking at um, ACT or acceptance and commitment therapy and to, to bring it into that. So uh, in conclusion, mind the hype. Try not to overstate the effects, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mindfulness practice, they can go hand in hand with different phases of cancer survivorship and can serve as important health behaviors no different than eating more green leafy vegetables or getting more steps. Uh, and it, it may actually lead to eating more green leafy vegetables and getting more steps. Um, outcomes like post-traumatic growth, self-compassion should be explored further, um, especially for their potential to impact health behaviors. And then be on the lookout for new ways to deliver mindfulness through tech-enabled platforms. Um, since I do have couple more minutes. I have just a, a non-Northwestern, selfish, shameless plug for True North Treks. Um, uh, it's a nonprofit that takes young adults with cancer um, out into nature following their treatment where they can find and be found uh, by other AYAs. And um, we, um, we believe in these three guiding connections. One is getting connected to nature after the very unnatural experience of cancer treatment. Um, connecting to others, and also connecting to ourselves through training and practice and mindfulness uh, and yoga. And um, coming out uh, in February, we will have our premiere screening of our new documentary film that has taken three years in the making. We will very likely be showing it here um, uh, sometime in 2020, and it was directed by Sofia Garcia's husband, Frey, so another disclosure there. Um, all right, that's it.